You may be familiar with the saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. And putting aside for a moment the horrors of human-sponsored dog fighting, there's some truth to this adage. There's something to be said for attitude, for determination, and a never-give-up mindset. You undoubtedly know people like this in your own life, or maybe this describes you. These are people who set audacious goals, who are willing to do whatever it takes, against all the odds, to achieve these goals. These are the hard workers, the go-getters. Hello, and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and a nutrition coach, and my mission with this podcast is to bring you the best subject matter experts and most inspirational stories to help you become the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. My guest this week is Franklin Osler Sr. Franklin is a 63-year-old professional bodybuilder who's been working out almost his entire life. As a child, he was very athletic, but was tall, skinny, and very introverted. But his life was about to change. He was going to be introduced to the sport of bodybuilding. And even though he didn't have any weight training experience or the build to be a bodybuilder, the hook was set and the arc of his life was forever changed. You know what, when I was a kid, I, I wouldn't go near weight. You know, being, being a tall, gangly kid, I was, I was the weakest kid out there. So I was never out there lifting weights. Everybody would be in, in the garages lifting weights and stuff. And I, I stayed away from that. I think the the way I got kind of sold on it, I had a girlfriend at the time, and her brother was a bodybuilder. And we, we went to one of his competitions, and just seeing the way that he was able to feel so comfortable out there and show what he had done with his work, it really had a lasting impression on me. From that experience, I kind of got started training, started working out, and it's just never, I've never gotten away from it. It became, it was my passion. I think a lot of us can relate to what Franklin is saying here. I know I certainly can. I had a very similar experience. To this day, I still remember my first trip to a Globo gym. I was in my 40s. I was skinny, skinny fat, really, and very weak. And it was intimidating, like very intimidating. There were these big, strong men in there grunting and moving around some big ass weights. I meekly walked around watching what other people were doing on the machines and then tried to copy them. I didn't dare go anywhere near the free weights because that area seemed to be reserved for the strong people. Think back to your first trip to the gym. Did you have a similar experience? Many older adults put off going to the gym. They feel intimidated. Maybe they're self-conscious about being out of shape, too overweight, or too underweight. Or maybe you're listening to this right now and you haven't yet joined a gym for one of these reasons. I would urge you, no, implore you really, to face your insecurities and find a gym that works for you. Although I was certainly intimidated initially, I found that 99% of those big guys and gals were actually very nice and in fact quite willing to help a beginner out. It turns out that those intimidating grunts and scary faces weren't meant to terrorize newbies. That's just a byproduct of hard work and effort. So at this point in our story, Franklin is a tall, lanky kid. He's very athletic, but he's self-conscious about going to the gym. But after witnessing his first bodybuilding competition, he's compelled to overcome his insecurities. I, you know, I jumped into it. And when I first <clears throat> went and got into it, you know, I wasn't really into lifting the weights at all. I mean, it was just the, the machines, Nautilus machines. So I got to go in, I lift the Nautilus machines. See, and then eventually I got influenced by it. My, my girlfriend's brother, and he, you know, he was on a whole nother level. He wasn't messing around with those machines, and he he was throwing weight around, and he was cocky, but I mean, cocky in a good way. You know, that's how I wanted to be. You know, I wanted to feel that comfortable and that confident, and so, you know, I got into the weights, and then it just took off from there. And now, in those early days, did you have a coach? Was this guy helping you or giving you tips, or were you just kind of getting in there and figuring it out yourself? I've always been the kind of person that would do their own research and kind of sit back and question things. And so I felt a lot more comfortable 
just gathering all the information on myself, but you know, on my own, which I did. I did a lot of reading. Of course, there, when I started up, there was obviously no internet then. So it was a lot of the magazines, the Flex magazine and uh, Muscle Builder, they called it back then. All, all of the magazines, I, my whole house was covered with magazines. And I'd be reading and studying, but never, but never coach. I used to coach one time. And that was actually, that was the, the competition that I won my pro card in. That's the only time I ever uh, actually used to coach. So Franklin is a self-starter. He's a tall, skinny 21-year-old, and he's decided he wants to be a bodybuilder. The problem is, tall, skinny guys, or gals for that matter, don't really make the best candidates for bodybuilders. But, armed with some magazine articles and serious determination, he sets forth on his journey. Being taller, it takes a lot more time in order to fill those long muscle bellies out. Depending on how your muscle is structured on your body, your insertion points, will decide how, how that muscle is going to be shaped and how it's going to look when it's fully developed. Taller guys, based on that, you know, they don't, it, it's just this sport is not really for taller guys to do to do that well because you don't have a lot of the, the body type structure, things that are required to be a good bodybuilder. So that was one of, you know, a big, not a deterrent, but it was just, it was just something that you, you had to consider in the way that you prepared yourself if you intended to, uh, to compete at all. You know, the the way I got started on the, the actual competition side of it is, you know, back in the day when, when we all trained at the same, there was only a few gyms where the bodybuilders trained. And if you trained there, then hell, every, everybody in there competed. Everybody kind of helped each other. It wasn't a big deal. So just by being in, in, in that environment, I think is, is the way that it influenced me to eventually have that real desire to get on stage. Talk to us about that. Your first show, I believe it was 1985. Is that right? When you did your first show? So talk to us about that show and the preparation leading up to that. Because by this time, you'd have been, you'd have been bigger. You'd have put on considerable amount of, of muscle mass, I'm, I'm guessing. But to step on stage, there's a lot more to, than just oh, yeah. lifting weights and being strong, right? So talk to us a little bit about leading up to that, that first show. Oh, yeah. That first show, the 1985 Muscle Beach, that's when, of course, I was bodybuilding. And I do men's physique now, but that was back in my early bodybuilding days. Yeah, I, I actually, like I said, no coach and just relying on discussions I'd have with other guys and stuff and, and what I was able to read. That first show, I didn't know what I was doing, and I was nowhere close to being ready to compete in a bodybuilding competition. Nowhere from a developmental standpoint or a mental standpoint either. I just wasn't ready. So, but I didn't know that, you know, that got exposed to me once I actually did it. But one of, one of the real crazy things about it, you know, I had uh, approached the show with a certain competition diet. We call it prep diet, where we're a diet that should be specifically designed to help you strip body fat, bring out muscularity. So, there's different, you know, different types of philosophies on how you approach that. And so I had, you know, just being, just not knowing what I was doing, I had pretty much read so much information. So I had like five or six different theories all floating in my head. I would start out with one diet method. And then if I wasn't liking the results two weeks later, I'd switch to something else. So I was going back and forth on what I was trying to do uh, from a dietary standpoint. And so everything was not. You know, I was losing weight and everything like that, but I had very little muscle anyway. And then just a little bit that I, I had, it seemed to be just be losing, losing muscle every day, losing strength. And then I changed my diet philosophy. You know, I go back and forth, back and forth. So, so I made, I made about every type of mistake that you can possibly make going into my first competition. Physically, I definitely wasn't ready. I mean, I had been training for a number of years by then, but being an ectomorph and being natural. I just hadn't put on a good degree of muscle. I mean, I looked more like a like a conditioned basketball player, and I was in a bodybuilding competition. And mentally, you know, I, I didn't have any confidence, none whatsoever, because you know, I, I, I mean, I'm in the gym with guys that I'm going to be, be competing against, and I'm looking at them, and I'm saying I'm nowhere near them. I, I'm nowhere near them. But there, it's funny because... As I was going through all of this, I was kind of discovering some things about myself as well, besides just the physical part. I was coming to the understanding that 
I had the ability to outwork, to literally outwork other people. I was the guy that was that was there early and leaving late. I mean, I never missed a workout. I went harder than everybody. And so that was kind of, even though I was getting, I was getting it handed to me on the stage, but I felt like ultimately my work ethic was going to push me past them. And I'd eventually be where I wanted to be, which, which came to pass, by the way. <laughs> yes, it did. And we'll certainly get there. So again, I, I want to back up a little bit because you alluded to this. And I think now's as good a time as any to discuss this. Again, not everybody listening to this podcast is going to know what bodybuilders go through in terms of diet cycles. A very typical bodybuilder will bulk up and then lean out for a show. Mm-hmm. Why don't you just take a minute or two and talk about just that at a high level, what bodybuilders in general do, and then Later on, we're going to dive in a little bit more specific to, into what you're doing. Okay. In bodybuilding, obviously, the, uh, the whole intent is to come in big, conditioned, and shapely. And, and so in your off-season, which is all off-season is just the time of the year when you're not in direct preparation for a competition. So during that off-season, bodybuilders will, will try to put on size. In order to put on size, you have to be in a caloric surplus. So they're eating bulking if you will and not like you know it's kind of the new terminology they use but but they're eating enough to get that muscle hypertrophy and then they're trying to add muscle and they're not very much concerned about body fat at that point and just just trying to uh put on size and then when they go into a contest prep period is when they've this is during the period when they've specifically identified a competition they're going to do and then they'll figure out how many weeks they need from the condition they're in right now to, to transform their body into competition condition. And then however length of time that is, that, that's, that's considered their contest prep period. And then they'll go ahead and, and, and go through that process, the prep period, and then, and then do a competition. So those are pretty much the phases. It's just, you know, contest prep and then, and then you know, off season is, is what people typically call it. Those are the two biggest uh, deals. So then just to recap, that off season is that, or that bulking season is when you're in a caloric surplus and really the goal is to put on as much muscle as you can. Yeah, yeah. And along with that, some fat's going to come up. No yes, matter sir. how good you are, you're going to get some fat, right? Mm-hmm. And then the inverse of that is as you're coming close to that or that show prep time, you're going to count back however many weeks you calculate. And you'll know this by experience, I'm sure, mm-hmm. after mm-hmm. doing it long enough. And then you're going to be in a, caloric deficit, right? So you're actually kind of dieting down. Now, the Mm -hmm. trick is (laughs) what you want to do is you want to lose that body fat and really lean out for that muscularity, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't want to lose any of the muscle. So there's really a, it's, it's a tightrope that you're walking Mm -hmm. there. And I I don't know that everybody's can really appreciate that, but there's a lot of, a lot of science and a lot of, of art really that goes into that. So that you can, the day you step out on that stage, you look your absolute best. Is that a fair way of saying that? Yes, it is. Yes, 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 it is. And everybody, you know, has a different approach to how they want to make that go. You know, like, you know, there's a lot of guys that have the philosophy that when they're, when they're in a contest prep period, they, they do more reps. They do more reps. And, you know, with the ideal of the more reps you do, the more energy you're using and the more you're going to. So they almost, a lot of them, to, in my opinion, you know, they kind of turn their weight training into a cardiovascular session. So they're doing all these mega sets and reps and everything like that, really not taxing the muscle enough to sustain. And then when they go into the uh, caloric uh, deficit, they end up losing muscle mass. And so my philosophy has always been, I don't change my workouts. When I go into a contest prep period, I still try to train as heavy and as hard as I always did, because I feel like I want to, I want to give my muscle a reason to stick around because that the calories are going to be going low. I'm going to be doing more cardiovascular stuff, be less energy available. So that muscle, I want to keep it. If I have to drop my weights, I don't just drop them because I think you know, I need to drop them. I drop them because I, I reduce my, my rep count because I physically can't do it anymore. So I let my body uh, make that decision. Gotcha. Yeah, it's that muscle on your body is metabolically expensive and yeah. it's yeah. it can be tough to convince yeah. your body to hang on to it. That's especially yeah. in a calorie deficit. That's well said. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of get back to your timeline here. You've done your first show. It sounds like you learned a lot. You learned some things mentally. You're probably maturing a little bit now. 
I believe it's going to be another couple of years before you do your next show. What's different in this second show prep from your first show? Oh, okay. Yeah. By the way, what I did when I got whooped so bad in that first show, what I realized and what I knew, I knew I, knew I needed to put on muscle. And I also know that I'm, I'm natural. My intention is to stay natural. So instead of jumping back on stage in another six months or even a year, I said, well, I'm not going back on stage for two years. And didn't do much better. It was a much bigger class this time. I had more guys in there. And I finished right near the bottom. But because, you know, my height was, was, was the issue. But what I was discovering was that I could do more than everybody else. I could work harder than everybody else. That, that was always my driving force is that I was never really discouraged because I still always felt I had control of, of ultimately what was going to happen. It was just going to take some time. So I, I just, when I would go back to the gym, I'd always have a little, let's say, depression period. You know, because I, I was getting whooped. Every show, you could count on me being right on the bottom. You know, I, you know and so every show... I'd get depressed afterwards, but then I give I give myself a week, two weeks, and then I'd be back in there, going on. You know, like I said, two years. I was giving it two years between shows initially. That's some dedication. I think a lot of people are probably raising their eyebrows when they hear that. They're thinking, okay, you you do this competition, you get whooped, two years to your next one. That's a long time mm-hmm. to to take to prepare, and you go in and to your point, you get whipped again. And right. You say, okay, you know what? I own the process, maybe not the outcome, but I've got control over this process Mm -hmm. and I have faith in myself and my work ethic. I'm going to keep going. I know I can do this. So there's a lot of determination and grit, I think, in that. Is that a good way of saying that, right? Now, the other thing in there, just real quick to to clarify, you've mentioned that you're natural and you intend to be natural and you're still natural. Perhaps some folks listening aren't aware of what that means. Just talk for a second about what does it mean to be a natural bodybuilder? Oh, well... So being natural just means that you're not using any pharmaceuticals, any PEDs at all to help you with your training. But don't get me don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not I'm not against those that make that choice. In fact, to be fair fair to say is that it, had I, with the passion that I have for bodybuilding, had I had all of the attributes that I think that, that were needed to really be a, a champion bodybuilder, I mean, at the top, I probably you know, I might have made a different decision. But I never really saw myself. And I never, I never felt like it was, you know, enough reward to jeopardize my health at all, because I, I, you know, what about, you know, what are bodybuilders making anyway? You know, I'm thinking, you know, so I'm not, I'm not even thinking about doing that. You know, and I'm getting enough satisfaction out of just, you know, being getting better. Try to come out, try to come out better the next show. So anyway, that's that's what natural is. It's guys that don't use any any PEDs at all. Right. So no performance enhancing drugs, mm-hmm. um, steroids, things of that nature. Yeah. And I think I read recently on one of your Instagram posts, you had said something to the effect of never being satisfied really makes you work harder. And I, I think that's a theme that we're that we're hearing here, right? Because yeah. you're going to go on and basically, is it fair to say that from 1985 till today, and we're recording this in April of 2021, you've been doing bodybuilding shows that entire time? And is that right? Well, Pretty much. I, I didn't do any shows from 2005 to 2013. That, that, that period, I, I still train. I still train just like a bodybuilder all the time. But that, but I was so overwhelmed on my job at the time. I just, I just could never really pick out, be able to put together a, a long enough time slot to really get ready for a show. So I didn't, I didn't do any shows for that whole uh, was that eight years. And, and that was, in fact, that that's when I stopped. You know, because I, I I do men's physique now, which which is kind which is kind of a different subdivision of uh, of bodybuilding. But but you know, in two thousand five, that was the last bodybuilding competition I ever did. Then when I came back in two thousand thirteen, I did men's physique, which is what what I do now. I turned pro in men's physique category. Yeah. Okay. So let's tease that apart about a little bit as well. So bodybuilding is what people are probably thinking about that classic giant humongous kind of physique, right? That's bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And there now, uh, and that may have been all there was when you started, I I would guess. Now there's several different categories for men and women in bodybuilding competition. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between physique, which are, like you said, that's what you're doing now. And that's what you've got your pro card in and traditional, the the bodybuilding class. Yeah. Like you said, bodybuilding is, is a much more bigger, 
more developed body that they're looking to compare you with. So it's a whole different, your entire body is evaluated for, you know, for conditioning, aesthetics, development, and so forth. Uh, so that's all, all plays into bodybuilding. And men's physique, the big thing with men's physique is, as opposed to wearing the little skibby shorts that you wear in bodybuilding, you wear a board short. So basically, you know, the board short, obviously your leg isn't going to be exposed except for your calf. So, so men's physique, you know, you're only, you're not, <clears throat> you're not being compared on your legs. You're, you're being compared uh, more just on your upper body and, and the, the criteria is a little different from bodybuilding. They're not looking at just how much, how big you are, how well developed you are. It's more of, they're looking for a different, it's a different look. It's more of a beach, athletic, very achievable type look that they're being, that's to being evaluated on. But that division itself has really grown so much that the you know guys are much, much bigger now. So it's almost like, uh, and there's also another category called classic physique, which is one up from men's physique, if you will. And it's, you know, the guys in, in, in men's physique basically almost look like classic bodybuilders with the amount of size they're carrying these days. But anyway, the original philosophy was was a more of just a, an achievable look, so, uh, the type of physique that if you were walking on the beach or something, you saw a guy and you said, man, I do, I do jacked. You know, it'd be more of that kind of a, body as opposed to big huge dude. Right. Yeah. You know, so that, 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 that's, that's the difference. Yeah. The bodybuilders are, these days are huge. I mean, just ridiculously huge. They're massive human beings. Mm -hmm. And that you're right. That physique category is definitely that more athletic look. And to your point, I, I suppose they are getting bigger and bigger as the mm -hmm. competition is getting more popular. Mm -hmm. So that size is kind of increasing a little bit. But that's that classic, like you said, the guy that's that's jacked. He looks yeah. great. He's in those typically posing in those board shorts. Okay, so let's let's kind of pick up then in 2013. You've taken some time off from competing, but not from working out. Why is that the time to come back? That's the year that I retired from my job. So I retired at at, at 55 years old, right on my 55th birthday. I retired. And by then, and ironic, that's, that's the same year that they, uh, men's, I think, well, I think men's physique actually, that, that division was created, I think, in 2012. But, uh, well, so it was brand spanking new. And at, at first, you know, I wanted nothing to do with it. Because I'm a, even though I wasn't a good bodybuilder, but I was a bodybuilder mentally. I'm one of those guys, I'm a student of the game. You know, I study bodybuilding. I went to the Mr. Olympia Ultimate Times. I, so I love bodybuilding. I still do to this day. I love bodybuilding. I knew every who Mr. Every Mr. Olympia was and so forth. So, so when this men's physique thing started hearing about this, I thought it was a joke and insulting. You know, I said, I'm board shorts? Nah. You know, but the more and more I got to really understand the division and also understand the fact that everybody has different desires. You have limitations in what you can do with your body. Everybody can't be an open bodybuilder, a very good, good one anyway. You can be one, you just won't be a good one. So the fact that there were different divisions, it, it just created, you know, you could, well, you could just get in where you fit in. And so you had to get your head around kind of, I guess, self-identifying as a physique competitor, which at first I, I think you were probably, no, that's, that's not me. I'm, I'm a bodybuilder. So you get your head around that and you decide you, you find a show on the calendar and I imagine you're you're pretty good at this by now. You decide, OK, time to start prepping and you're going to go into that. You know, you're, we had talked about that whole muscle building and then conditioning piece. How did that first physique show go? You know, it's funny because the first physique show, of course, of course, by, by then I'm already old enough to do master's category. Master's at that time was 40 and I was uh, 55. So anyway. You know, coming into that first show, I, in the division was was, was fairly it was just new, only a year old. I had no idea how to how to oppose or, e or even anything. I, I didn't know anything about it. So, but you know, I, I thought it was I thought it was a joke anyway, and I felt like as a, me as a bodybuilder, you know, you let me have to you let me do a competition where I don't have to show my legs, I won't get beat. And that's that's how I felt about men's physique. So I, when I did that first show. I went out there super, super cocky and just not even knowing how to pose. I was doing 
almost like bodybuilding poses. And I actually, it was a master's category and I got, I got whooped and I just, I couldn't believe it. I got beat by guys who I had like three times more muscle. And I'm like, what's going on? So in, anyway, that I, I, I learned and I'm all, all, you're always learning in the sport. Every show you learn something. What I learned was that I really had to, I had, had to take care of business out there. What I had done in the past as a bodybuilder, be just you know putting on size and all that, and having done all these competitions as a bodybuilder, didn't mean nothing. Now I was in a new division, and I, I needed to get my head straight and figure out what I needed to do and, and prepare myself. So I did master's category, like I said in that show, and I came in. I, I placed, but I placed low, and uh, it was so so it was almost like not even placing at all for me. But like I said, I I, I knew what to do. So, so I went back knowing that, that it's time to go to work. Yeah. So I, I suppose then it sounds like you went into that first physique competition, kind of counting on being the big guy, right? You're like, well, man, I've, yeah. I've done all these bodybuilding shows. I'm going to, I'm going to whip all these skinny guys right. You get in there and find that maybe that's not what the game is there, right? Yeah. They're looking for a different aesthetic, I suppose, the judges. Yes, and mm -hmm. uh, they're, to your point, I didn't think about that, but there's probably different posing required. And like you said, <laughs> you place lower than you thought you would. And, but to your point, you learned, right? Yeah, you, yes, and you decided, okay. And it, you're, you sound like a guy who resolve isn't a problem and yeah. determination and work ethic's not a problem. So you just went back at it. Yeah. What happens after that? What where do you go from there in your next show mm -hmm. or shows? Right right after that show, there there was a another show six weeks later that was much bigger. It was a much bigger magnitude show, the Titan. That's what that show was. It was up in LA. <clears throat> and so it was six weeks out. So I, I knew that, you know, I just needed to bring my condition up a little bit, which I had plenty of time to do that. And I needed to learn how how to show myself in that sport in terms of posing to show confidence, but not arrogance, you know, how to, how to work my angles better, open up my back and, and how to appeal to the judges, which is the key. You know, that's what that the, the sport has had more to do with that than it did. You know, bodybuilding, you be, you're just, you're the biggest Jack dude and you can hit those, you can hit the poses, right. You're, you're, that's the guy that wins, the most massive, impressive guy. But physique was different. I mean, there's, there, there was a different way to be impressive. And so I knew that going into that next show. And so the next show, like I said, six weeks out, I brought my condition up a little bit and I worked on some posing. And the next show is when I took sword. I won overall. I, I won the, the 40, the 45, 35, Overall sword, overall masters. I won, and it was, and it was legitimately stacked. You hear people say stacked nowadays. It could have been five people in their class. They say it's stacked. I I, I went through a stacked forty five division, a stacked forty division. The thirty five division wasn't as many, but I went through stack. I have fifteen plus in every division, and here I am. I was fifty five at the time, and and, and I, I I beat I whooped them all. After that show. I never did a regional. Oh, I did one more regional show, and then I start, and I just went after the pro card after that. One one national show after another. Okay, so that's a great story. I love that that you went into that first competition, and your words got whooped. Just kind of went in there a little cocky and maybe not as knowledgeable as you could have been, but you learned. And yes. only six weeks later, as opposed to two years later, yes. you you said, you know, I've, I've, all I got to do is bring this conditioning in a little bit and I can, I can do, now I know what's expected of me. I can do this. You go in and basically you clean up. Now you use the, the term, I think you said took sword. Probably most people other than, and I know there's some bodybuilders that probably are listening to this, but fo folks outside of that world have no idea what that means. What, what does taking sword mean? Well, taking a sword is, you know, when you win overall in any division or, or, or for the whole show, when you're, you're the overall winner, and you get a, a sword or, or something that, that's as much more than, say, an average class winner. They're going to get a trophy and so forth. But, the, you know, you, you, you get an actual sword. And, and so you see, oh, there's a lot of guys that don't have swords. I mean, these guys that are top pros and everything never won, you know, an open uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, hats off too. That is fan. That's a fantastic story. So 
you had mentioned then at that point, you've won, you kind of cleaned up from the 35 on up and you're 55 at this time. And now you've got your eyes set on a pro card. What does it take to get a pro card? Well, there's, I, I want to say there's a seven uh, national level shows that they hold each year. I could be wrong on that, but it used to be it was seven. First of all, you have to qualify to to compete in a national show. And once you become nationally qualified, then those are the competitions that you can actually win a pro card in if you finish, depending on how each show is set up. But you either got to win your division or play second in some cases, and, and, and you'll obtain a pro card but in your class. So, you know, it's, it's, they're weaning it down to the only nationally qualified guys, then you have to be one of the top ones in order to get a pro card. So it's that whole process there. And talk us through that. We know that you've gone on and won a pro card. How did that go for you? When, Given that you were in 2013, you did these two back-to-back shows. How long was it before you actually obtained that pro card? Well, I didn't, I didn't get the pro card until 2018. Once I became nationally qualified, I started doing Masters Nationals. I, I did the uh, my first national show, I want to say 2002, yeah, 2014, I did Masters Nationals. And then after that, I was I was already like 56 by then, started, started competing in the categories that they had. The Masters level was 45. So when I came in, I was doing 45 divisions, and I was already 56. And so I, I was giving up a few years there. And but I take pride in saying that I was I was in the top five every national show I ever did except for one in 2017 I I didn't place in the in the top five it was the only year but I I, I did before I actually got the pro card hell between Masters Nationals in in, in the North America those were the only two I was doing then I was doing those back to back back to back uh, those those are, those shows are in Pittsburgh. And so I, I, hell, I went through before I actually got got the pro card. Probably completed at least eight national shows, you know, between Masters Nationals in uh, North America, and and I finally was able to to get first in sixty. All um, right, so if so, then you were sixty when you got your pro card. Is that is that right? Yes, that is a fantastic accomplishment. And now you're still competing today. Is that right? Yep, got a got a show in July. Got a show in July, and I think we already mentioned that we are recording this in April, so just a few months out. Talk to us a little bit. What does a typical workout week look like for you? And in, in terms of how many days are you on, off, and what is your what are your splits look like? Well, I, I, I'll go through my contest prep now because I'm actually in that period right now, so it's easier for me to. You know, I, I do a lot, man. I guarantee I do more than most. You know, especially more than young guys. The way a typical day for me is, I get up. And I do a lot of things that are different, though. You know, I, don't, I train on an empty stomach. I don't eat anything. Maybe I have a banana or something like that. But I train in the morning. I train my, my first session is in the morning. I train two body parts. And, and then I also do 25 minutes of cardio. And I do that in the morning. That's my, that's my first workout. And then I come back later in the evening and do another workout, which is just abs. I train abs every day, which is most of the guys on abs is my my weaker area in terms of being able to really show a lot of detail and, and depth and everything. So I, I train abs every single day. So that, that second workout is, is a little bit more cardio. I start out my cardio. I just do I do 25 minutes in each session right now. And then that's that's, that's 50 minutes a day. And then I, you know, then I do abs every day. And then I do like I saw two body parts. 50 minutes total in abs every day. And so that pretty much, I, I, that's a four-day split. So in other words, I'm, over a four-day period, I will have trained every single body part in four days. And I train legs. I train legs on on, on the last day of my, my split. So my next day is rest. But every day is the same. It's, it's I started out, I train in the morning, and then I come back. When I come back in the evening, it's always that same workout. But, you know, as I progress along in my prep, that changes usually in terms of how much cardio I'm doing. It may go up, it may go down. It just depends. But I always stick, I stick with that same split, train in the morning, and then come back. And so is that a four-day on, one-day off, and you're just repeating that cycle? Yes, sir. That's exactly what it is. 
Okay, so let's let's talk about that. That's a lot of volume, and that's obviously to to look the way you do. That's <laughs> that's what it takes, right? So, talk to us a little bit about recovery. What strategies do you use to recover to be able to really push your body like that for these two times a day, four days on, one day off type weeks? Well, you know what? To be honest with you, that's always been a problem for me. Is is just slowing down. You know. A lot, a lot of times I don't take days off. It'll be off day. I'll take say four and one off. It'll be one off and I'll do cardio or something like that. I, I don't have a, a real solid recovery plan as far as some, something that I, I do on a consistent basis. But I just listen to my body and I kind of I take a rest when I need it. You know, if, if I need to take longer than my one day off in between splits, I'll go ahead and, and, and extend the day or something like that. But, but you know, I, I try to get my massages. You know, and not as much as I should. I try to get my massages. I have different type of hand massagers, and I use foam roller and stuff like that. So I try to stay on top of it. I don't stretch enough, and uh, stretch is a bad thing for me. And also, don't, I also have trouble keeping my water up and drinking enough water. So I, those are the, actually some some of the hardest hurdles I have is making sure that I'm keeping my water up and that I that I'm taking care of my body in terms of the therapeutic part of it. And have you, I haven't heard so far in our story, any major injuries. Have you found yourself battling injuries? And I can't imagine you've been at this for as long as you have and haven't had to overcome injuries, but has that become more frequent as you're, as you're aging? Or are you managing to keep that pretty much in check? You know, I have problems when I was, I don't know, in my mid forties, I had very severe back problems, herniated disc. You know, that was, that was a major problem for me. So I had to go through a lot of you know, corrective exercising and stuff like that to try to improve my back flexibility and build it and all that. So, so I went through all of that, and you know, I have I have problems now. You know, my shoulders, you know, from all those years of training, and you know, the shoulders is are bad, and so I have to do different types of uh, warm up work workouts and stuff. I actually blew out a rotator a number of years ago playing football. So now I, I, feel, I don't feel too bad about where, where I'm at now. I feel pretty good when I go in the gym, but at my age, it is day to day. You know, there are some days when, when I, 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 you know, everything seems to be aching more, but even those days, I still get it in. You know, I just, I just take a little, I just adjust that day. I just go longer on my warm ups. I keep a band in my belt all the time. I mean, in my, my workout bag, I have a band. So I'm always, in between sets, I'm loosening up my joints a little. Just spend a little bit more time. I'm loosening up if I need to do it on that day. If I don't, then I, then I get after it. And that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that relates back to what you said. You just, you know, your recovery strategy is primarily, it sounds like, listening to your body and being in tune with that and, and honoring that. Well, Franklin, you've been at this for an incredibly long time. It's been over 40 years, right, that you've been working out and, and doing these shows still at it. So my question is, is how do you stay motivated over that period of time to put in this hard work and do what you're doing? Yeah, it's, it's a passion, man. It, it really is. It's, it, it's no, you know, I don't get paid a nickel to do it. And I've been doing it. it you know, it's every, every day is the same. I, I go on vacation. If I go on vacation, I'm, I'm training. I mean, I'm going to train at the hotel gym. I'm going to find a gym somewhere. Or what have you? It's just something I just love it, and, and it's, it's always been uh, as much mental for me in terms of you know what it does for me and my benefit. It's been as much mental as you know as, as it is physical. So I, I, I have to have it. You know, it's, it's like my drug. I just have to admit that. But but it's it's a healthy one because I feel like at my age, you know, I I, I not only look very good for my age, I'm also very functional. I mean, I can still get after it in this gym with young guys and they know it. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. So when if you ask somebody to just imagine a 63-year-old man, they're not picturing you typically, right? The way you look and to your point, the way you function. So that that's fantastic. And you had mentioned that that you love the the physical side of it and the mental side of it. And you kind of alluded to it bleeding over into other areas of your life. How has this working out 
lifestyle and these bodybuilding achievements, how has that bled over into other areas of your life? Well, the whole lifestyle puts kind of a, a, a hamper on a lot of things like relationship wise and stuff like that, you know, because it's, it's not, you never turn it off. It affects like whether or not you can, you, you can eat anything or like parties and stuff like that. So that's always, and if you're in a relationship, then or whatever, that's always, you know, they have to respect that, you know, or either, or even though they may not even be have, have anything to do with that, they have to respect that. So you're, you're, uh, you're made. So it's had some challenges in that regard, but it, but also at the same time, it, it's been what's, you know, it, it's, it's been really something that's helped me to release, express myself. And, and also it's helped, it's helped me with another level of confidence because it's like, you know, I, I got into this thing not not having the, the goods for it, you know. But look at me; I didn't have the. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't have looked at me back then and said, "Oh man, that guy going to be a bodybuilder." No, nah, not nah, nothing close. You know, I didn't have any of that. But yet I overcame all that just through, you know, consistency, persistence, hard work. That's it. That's it. People as they say it, is, it sounds corny and all that, but I can tell you, you put that time in. And it all pays off. And that's what that, that's what I'm living proof of that. That's very well said. Yeah. And you had alluded to early on in, in your bodybuilding career, and I think you you mentioned this in in regard to nutrition that you kind of were hopping from one program to another. And I, I see that in in folks and, and they're working out and they're kind of going from one thing to another and they're not sticking with things long enough and they're looking for the answer in a specific program. Well, if I just, if I do this program this many days a week, or if I do this program, but really if you had a pyramid, that would be the top of the pyramid, the, the programming probably that base is going to be that work ethic, that hard work, that consistency, that grinding day in and day out is, is that fair? Do you think? It is. It is because what is, you know, what it, what it came, what it's come down to, is it's just discipline or anything. You know, it's like the motivation. There's some days where, you know, where it's not my best training day. You know, and I might may not even feel like training that day, even though that's kind of rare for me to be honest with you. I always want to train, but but you know, but it could. There's, there's some days, you know, especially during prep, and calories might be kind of low. You might even feel like one, but but it's that discipline. Is, is what really keeps you going is when you, when you make that commitment to do something, you make that promise to yourself and then, you know, whether or not you're going to continue to push and meet that commitment or you're going to punk out. You know, I, I, I choose to always go and, and meet that commitment because I, you know, I don't have a problem with letting other people down, but I'm not going to let me down. You know, if I, if I say we're going to do this then we're going to do it. And where do you think that comes from? I mean, we've heard that throughout your story, this commitment, this discipline. Where does that come from? You know, I, for me, I think it comes from like like playing scared. I, I always feel like that's that's all I have. I mean, that's what's going to do it for me. You know, like I said, I, I never feel like I got the goods otherwise. So it's just that fear of, of, of just not doing it, man. It's just like, look, I feel like that's the, I don't have the gimmicks not going to work for me. What's going to work for me is I'm just going to do, I'm going to do three times as much, three times as long. And I'm going to see if that's enough. You know, otherwise I think if I, if I do what everybody else does, then I don't have a chance. It's just me. Yeah. You know, I feel like I, I don't have that. I'm just not going to be the one that walks in and just walks over something. I'm going to have to kick the door in. So I've always, I always have that blow it up get it done type mentality. You know, it's just, you know, it's just me. Yeah. That, well said. I, I love it. Mm -hmm. Well, frankly, here's a question. What would you be doing today if bodybuilding wasn't in your life? If you didn't go down this path, what do you think your life would look like? Well, if I was still working, you know, of course I, I would, in my field, you know, I have the same approach to everything that I do in terms of hard work. So, so I'm always be the hardest worker on my. I was the hardest worker on my job. You know, I just it's just in the, if, if I, I wasn't bodybuilding right now, don't know exactly what I'd be doing if I wasn't still working because it's. But it would have to be something with a challenge. I, I you know, 63 to me has never been. That's not when it's supposed to end for me. You know, and I don't even know when it's supposed to end because I 
you know, I, I mean, I, I tried to retire from bodybuilding many years. And every, every year I say, well, this is it. I, I, I'm not going to do it again. But 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 that's just me just saying it because it's just supposed to be the right thing to do at certain ages and certain times. But my heart always says, one more door to kick in. One more door to kick in. Like right now, I'm 63. I got my pro card at 60. I've already done, I've done two pro shows. And, you know, should, should, should be time for it to be over. Should, should have been over a long time ago for me, you know. But 60, I still feel it. I still feel the desire. I still feel it in my that I can still do it. I still feel like I can outwork them. And like I said, that's my thing. It's always going to be like I don't care. They can be, but well, they got to be sixty now. That's that's what I always. That's confidence. Like it's like if if, if when I was 55, 35 couldn't mess with me. It's the same way now. I'm okay. If I'm sixty three, sixty shouldn't be able to mess with me. You know, so I, I go out there just just feeling like. I'm going to do more. I'm going to go harder. I'm going to be more consistent. And I'm going to just, that's going to make up the difference. You know, it didn't, it didn't so far. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done 160 division and got whooped. And it come out, that was, that was, that was just recently come coming right out of quarantine. But that's only because I, well, I shouldn't say only, I got beat by guys that were good, but I, I, I wasn't at my best because I, I didn't have my normal time frame that I need to get ready. So I feel like I just wasn't at my best. Although, like I said, the guys that beat me, they, they were very good, very good. And they deserve to beat me. So but, but it'll yeah. be different. It's yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm, I'm looking at you and I, mm-hmm. the folks that listen to the podcast can't see this. I can see it in your demeanor. You're just exuding this. Let me add it kind of attitude. I can imagine. Yeah. You getting whipped in a show is probably bad news for everybody in the next show. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Here's a question. What if somebody's listened to this and we'll just say it's a, it's a let's say it's a guy, he's in his 60s um, and he's gotten recently into decent shape and maybe he's a skinny guy. I don't know. But he hears this and he thinks, gosh, I, I never really thought about that. Could I, could I do a bodybuilding show? Is that just too audacious? What advice would you have for that person who's just thinking, nah, I don't know, that, that just seems like a dream, but man, it sure sounds cool. Yeah, I mean... You can do anything. You know, my, what I would tell someone like, like that is that, you know, see, the thing about body, a comp, a, a, a actual competition that you're going to enter, it's the, it's the only thing that you're ever going to do that's going to make you be as best, the best you can be. I mean, because anything else you could say, well, okay, I want to get in great shape by three weeks from now. There's nothing like saying in three weeks from now, someone else, a third party is going to judge me and compare me against a bunch of other people. That's a whole different animal right there. You can make that commitment to yourself, but when you decide you're going to get out there showing half your body and, 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 and guys are going to look at you and judge you, and then that takes it to a whole nother level in terms of what, what kind of pressure it puts on you and what you're willing to do and how hard you work to get ready for it. So so competition is, is that's, that's, I, I would I would tell someone, you know, if you, you'll, you'll never see it until you compete. You know, you'll never see. You're doing a, you did a transformation and everything. You look great. You lost a bunch of weight. Okay, you want to go next level with it. In other words, you want to look like a guy that just does this. Okay, you got to be a guy that just does it, that competes. And if you do that, then it's going to make you reach and do it at another level. Otherwise, you're just going to be about right where you're at right now. And if you go, if you're okay with that, then live with that. You know, but don't if you if it's something that you're going to think think about in terms of man, I wonder. See that guy with abs and all vascular like that. I wonder if I can do that. Well, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to make that commitment to do it, do a competition. So it's always out there. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is, go for it, right? Go for it. It, find a show, put it on the calendar, and that's you know, if that depends on where you are. If that's a year out, two years out, five years out. Yeah. If that's six months out. But to your point, nothing will motivate you quite like stepping out half naked on a stage yeah. with your peers being judged specifically on your body against your peers. That's, that's yeah. pretty motivating, <laughs> pretty motivating, real fact there. All right. So Franklin, would you like to give any shout outs to anybody um, who maybe have helped you along the way? Uh, well, you know, you know, you, you never do a competition without help. That's one thing because it's involved so many people that are involved in, in helping you out emotionally or what have you, but, you know, my son, who is always a, a good critic for me. 
You know, my, my son, my son was raised on protein shakes. I mean, my son's been around bodybuilding all his life. And so, uh, you know, I'll ask my son, how am I looking? You know, so definitely ain't going to shut my son. I think my girlfriend, my girlfriend, Frances, who's, who's a nutritionist, she's helped me out a lot with pulling my meals together. And she's another one that, that's, that's good at giving me the critique that I need. So, so yeah, she's another one. So, so the, I mean, like I said, you don't do it alone. Yeah, well said. Mm-hmm. And we know you've got this show coming up here. I think you said in July, it's coming up for you pretty quick. But other than that, what's what's next for you? What's on the horizon? Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, I I, I know that I, I still love to compete, and I'm still my daily thing is still going to be. I go to the gym, and I'm trying to improve myself. I'm going to do that until they put me in that box, you know, that's just going to be what I do. But if there's anything else that I, I, I do uh, as far as just industry wide or anything like that, you know, I, who knows, you know, you know, I, 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 I tinker with doing a little, little bit of influencer stuff on Instagram and stuff like that. I don't know if that ever, if I, if that ever could materialize into something, but I'm just really enjoying staying in shape. And like I said, I love the game. You know, I love the game. You know, if I can still get out there and bust up some sixty-year-old cats, you know, I'm a, I want to do that. <laughs> you know, do that. Yeah, well, I still, I still enjoy it. You know, still, still what I like to do. Fantastic. All right, and yeah, to, we, you had mentioned Instagram there, and that's how I found you. What is that the best way for people to connect with you if they want to learn more about you and, and inter, interact with you? So yeah, I, IG would be the way to contact me if you have any questions. I'm always open to questions and stuff. I, you know, I ain't, I ain't nobody. <laughs> you know, I'm just a guy that likes to get after. It. You know, that's it. You know, I love to train. Got a passion for it. I'll, I'll talk your ear off. I'll give you way more information than you want. Trust me. Fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll drop your Instagram handle into the show notes so folks can find you there. Mm-hmm. So Franklin, I just want to thank you for coming on the show today and taking the time, sharing your knowledge with us your wisdom, your story. You look fantastic. You are a great ambassador for healthy aging. And I certainly wish you all the luck in the world and all your future endeavors. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Been a pleasure. Well, that's our show for today, folks. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends and please consider subscribing and giving us a five-star review. All the show notes and much more are available at our website at silver-edge.com. That's silver-edge.com. So until next time, stay strong.